Okay, so let's get started. All right, so uh, I hope you all had a good exam. How was the exam from your perspective? Easy, hard, hard, very hard, okay. What about anybody else thought had any other opinion? No, okay. Logical. Logical. Logical, okay, that's good. So it's not illogical. <laughs> All right. So we will grade, start grading it tomorrow. We'll try to get some feedback back soon. All right. Uh, my TS thought it was easy. I thought it was moderately hard, not hard. Okay, but that's, we'll see. We, who was right? <laughs> But the TA felt it was an easy exam. Anyway, uh, so uh, keep in mind that there is a lab due okay, on April 1st. So I don't have much time between now and the lab. So focus on getting the lab done. Okay, the lab has as much, if not more, credit than the exam. So uh, so keep that in mind. Okay, if you have any questions about the lab, we are here. Office hours have restarted after spring break. So come and ask questions. Okay. All right. Any questions before I start about the lab or anything else? People have started on the lab, right? Okay. It's time you should have at least started, otherwise you will have issues finishing. All right, okay, good. So let's uh, start today. We have two problems to discuss in distributed systems. One I already introduced last time, we talked a little bit about it. I will reintroduce it and then re do a quick recap and then continue. That's on leader election, okay? And the second one is called mutual exclusion. This is where we see how to do distributed locks, okay? How do you take the concept of a lock, which you probably have seen when you have multi-threaded program and try to make it distributed, okay? Okay, so just as a recap, we started this last time. Uh, what is the leader election problem? Essentially, when you have a set of processes in a distributed systems and they want to choose a coordinator direct, uh, for, some, uh, for some task, okay? how do they themselves decide who the coordinator process is? The coordinator in this case will be called the leader. What the coordinator does is not as important okay? because the coordinator could be, uh, you know, uh, essentially the master server and the clock synchronization algorithm, or it could be a super peer in a peer-to-peer -peer system, okay? So the role of the, why you are choosing the leader is not as important here, but how to choose the leader is what we are going to discuss, okay? So, and in some sense, it doesn't matter which of the processes get chosen as the leader, you just need one leader, okay? And the idea is either when the system starts, you start off the leader election algorithm, you pick a coordinator, that coordinator then takes over the role of whatever they are doing. Or if the current coordinator fails, then you can restart the leader election algorithm to pick a new leader. Okay, so in either of these cases, you have to essentially run this algorithm. Okay, and last time I talked about the bully algorithm. I'm going to speak about that very quickly here. Okay, and then we'll talk about the next one, which is the ring algorithm. So here is the, the basic idea. So in the bully algorithm, uh, what we want to do is we'll assume that processes are ordered from uh, 0 through n, okay? and you want to pick the highest ID process that is still alive as your coordinator. That's the rule. Okay? Now, this is just an arbitrary rule. You don't have to say I have to pick the highest ID process. You could have said I can pick the least loaded process as the coordinator, or I can pick the node with the the most amount of CPU resources at the coordinator, the criteria for how you choose the uh, coordinator can keep changing. Okay? Here, we pick a very simple criteria, which is you order the nodes, pick the highest order node, uh, highest ID node as the coordinator. Okay? And the basic idea is any process can start the election algorithm. Okay? So in this example that you see here, process number four has started the election algorithm. And the way you start an election algorithm is you assume you know the IDs and the IP addresses of all the processes in the system, okay? So four is going to send now a message to five, six, and seven, okay, saying let's start an election, 
Okay, seven was the old coordinator is gone down. Okay, that's why there's an X there. Okay, so it will not get the message. It's a message will not reach it, but it will get to five and six. Okay, and then when you receive an election algorithm or let's start an election message from one of your lower ID nodes, you basically just send back an OK message to that node saying we got the election algorithm. Okay, and uh, the OK message serves as an I am a live message to a lower ID process. So you know that that process knows that there's at least one higher ID process that is alive and someone else is going to win the election, not it, because there is, it knows that there's somebody who has a higher ID, uh, higher ID than itself. So it's one of those nodes is going to win. So it's going to drop out. Okay? So essentially five and six send OK messages to four, four drops out of the election. And then this process is going to recurse. Okay? Five and each, I will start an election, six will start an election. So what's going to happen is you see your five start a, started an election by sending a message to six and seven. You see that six also started an election by sending a message to seven. Of course, that message to seven doesn't get to it. And then when six gets a request from five, it's going to send an OK to five, which causes five to drop out. Okay, When you get an OK, that tells you that there's a higher ID process, so you drop out of the election. So now six is the only one left. Right? So six is going to declare itself the winner and say, I am the new coordinator and send out. Okay? So that's basically a very quick recap of uh, bully algorithm. Multiple elections can be in progress at the same time. Okay? Each election can have an election ID with it so that you know what you're responding to. So if four had started an election and three had started an election, this whole process would continue. And in both cases, six would be the one that would win because it is still the highest ID process. Okay? So it doesn't change the fact that multiple elections can start. That's okay. You will end up with the same end result, at least in this case. Okay? If seven comes back up, seven is crashed, it comes back up. It can see that it has a higher ID process than six, which is the current coordinator. It can start an election. It will win immediately because there's no other higher ID process. And it can declare itself the coordinator and take back the coordinator role if it wants to. Okay, is this clear? Very simple election algorithm. Okay, I'm going to talk about another one and then we'll compare the two. Okay, this one is called a ring based ring based election algorithm. Okay, same concept. Okay, as there are processes in the system, they want to elect a coordinator. We'll assume all processes are have, have unique IDs. Okay, and in this case, we'll assume they are arranged in a logical ring. Okay, so each process only needs to know its neighbors. Okay, in the previous one, each process needed to know the ID of all other processes, so you could send back messages. Here, you only need to know your left neighbor and the right neighbor in the ring. Okay, and here is basically how you are going to make it work. So, so any process can start an election. Here, you see that same concept as previously. Okay, now you are in a logical ring. Five has started an election, and two also started an election independently because both five and two saw that the coordinator had crashed. Okay, so what happens in this case is you basically to start an election, you put your ID onto a message and you send it to your neighbor. The neighbor appends its ID and sends it to a neighbor, and this this message is going to circulate to the ring and come back back to whoever started the election, and the IDs of every process that has received that message and forwarded it to his neighbor is now back in that message. Okay? Then you just look at all the IDs in the process and you pick the highest ID process in the in that message as the new reader. Okay? So here you will see that five sent a message saying I am five to six. Okay? Six is going to append its ID to the message. So it will be five and six. It's going to try to contact seven. Seven is dead, so it can't do that. So it will then contact the next neighbor, which is zero. You send it to zero, zero is appended to ID, so you have five, six, zero. That's going to circulate to the ring and come back to five. Okay? And five has all of the IDs. You'll see that six is the highest ID process. So it will send six as one the election as another message that will circulate through the ring. Okay? And you see at the same time, two started a different election. Okay? That message is also circulating. So you'll see that two has appended its ID, came to three, three appended its ID, then it's come to four, and that will continue to circulate. Okay. And it will make a full circle and come back to two. And two will see again all the process IDs that are alive. And it will also choose six. So both of those elections are going to give you the same end result.
right? Is this clear? What we are trying to do. So essentially, we are querying processes. In one case, we queried higher ID processes. Here, we are using a ring logical link topology to query uh, nodes to see who is up and who is not, and then we pick one that has the highest ID. Is this clear? Okay, question there. Any in any leader election algorithm, any ID, any node can start an election. Yep. Yes. Okay, so there's a question here about what happened. So that, let me rephrase the question so it's clear what is actually uh, being asked. So what happens if in the middle of a leader election algorithm in progress, some node either crashes or some other node comes back up? Okay, so the leader election algorithms give you stable results only if the node structure is stable while the election is in progress. Okay. You could have asked your question by saying this leader election technique is choosing six, but before you declare six as the leader, what if six also crashes? Then again, your leader election has failed. And in your case, you said seven came up and maybe seven gets chosen, maybe it doesn't get chosen, what happens, right? So so if, if you have dynamics in the midst of an election, you're not going to get a stable result. Then you may have to restart the election and that's okay. You can restart and eventually you will converge, okay? So, so the idea here is you will get a good result only if the nodes that are participating are stable, that no new nodes are coming up or no new nodes are crashing, then you have stable result. Otherwise, you may not get the right result, you might have to restart or something. Okay, next question. Okay. Okay, what happens if the ring is so large, it's not feasible to get a stable result, then we have a problem <laughs> because uh, uh, because if you have nodes going up or down, you will not get a result that is stable. The only right answer to that question, maybe you need hierarchies in that case. You have to have smaller groups that are stable and they can have their own leader and then you have to have some decentralized technique. You don't have to have one coordinator in that case. Because in the peer-to-peer -peer system, that's exactly what the, might happen. So there are lots of dynamics in P2P systems. So you had super peers that only controlled a smaller group, not the entire network. So that's still okay. But if you try to do it for the whole network in P2P, you would actually have that issue. Okay. Yes. Okay. Question is if this is a ring based approach, the processes will have the uh, nodes of the next ID. In this case, you see that if the node has crashed, you need to know your neighbor's neighbor also. Right. So technically, you can't just get away by saying, I only can know my immediate left and right neighbors. Okay? Because if one or both of them crash, then I don't know who else to communicate to. So the ring has to still uh, continue to function if you know, some node has failed. Right? So when there are failures, you need to know your neighbor's neighbor and things of that sort. Okay? So you could do that by essentially sending a message in the other direction and probing who was your neighbor's neighbor or something. So you could have said, I am Seven's neighbor, I need to know who was Seven's neighbor and send the message the other way and find out. Or you can keep multiple, like you can say, I keep my neighbor's IDs, I keep my neighbor's neighbor's ID, I keep my neighbor's neighbor's ID because two nodes can fail at the same time. So you have to keep some more information for this to function. If you strictly keep only seven, you won't know who, that there is zero is the next one to send to in this case. right? So that you have to deal with. Any other questions? Okay, so let's just do a very quick analysis of this, uh, both of these, bully and uh, ring. So you will see the ring complexity is 2n minus 1 messages. Okay, because in this case, uh, one node has failed. So each circular, once you circulate to the ring, you send n messages, and you declare the result, then another message circulates. Okay? So that's 2n minus 1 messages. Okay, that's the complexity of the ring algorithm. The bully one, is a little more complex that depends on who started the election. Okay, if the lowest order node started an election, you have order n square messages. So you send 
n minus one messages and you recurs, then you have n minus two in the next election and so on and so forth. So, so you'll basically get uh, order n square. That's n minus one plus n minus two plus n minus three all the way to one. Okay. In the best case, the highest order process starts the election. It immediately wins and it sends message, n minus two messages to everyone else saying, I am the new leader. Okay. So you will be somewhere in between those two, depending on who has actually started the election. But the general complexity is order n square. Yes. Okay. So you will see that one is linear, the other one is quadratic in complexity. Is that clear? All right, so let's now, so that's leader election. We'll now talk about a different problem, which is distributed synchronization. Okay, this is basically a problem of uh, making a lock distributed. If you know how to do locking, right? you did this for threads programming and so on. Let's take a case where you need the lock itself to be distributed. How do you actually deal with that? Problem? Okay, so for single processes, you can use semaphores, locks, monitors, the distributed system processes may be running on multiple machines. So you can't keep the lock state with one process. The other processes may not know what the lock state is. So, so you need a mechanism for making this work in a distributed environment. And we'll see multiple approaches. One that uses a coordinator to coordinate the lock. That's a simple approach. And then we'll see more decentralized and distributed approaches for keeping locks and see how they all work. All right. So here is a very simple example. This is kind of more like a lab example to know why you might need a distributed lock. You have multiple clients that are going to, let's say, an online store, making buy requests or checking the current state of the catalog and so on. And since multiple of them are making requests at the same, at similar times, there may be race conditions that may cause the stock amount of items in stock to change dynamically and so on. If you don't use locks to do this, you will have some race conditions and bad things. Okay? Now, in case of your lab, you got away by just putting the lock on the server side. You didn't have to worry about it. Okay? You just put, put locks there and that was fine. That's a fine approach. But in some cases, you can't just do that. You might have to have the lock actually be distributed across multiple processes because if the client, let's say client sends a request, the server holds the lock and then the client dies and then does not do anything subsequent to release that lock, then your rock is going to be stuck forever. So you have all these problems in a distributed environment that you have to deal with. Okay? This is why the lock concept of a lock in a distributed setting is actually quite complicated, as we will see. All right. So let's start with the simple case of how can you make a lock work in a distributed setting. So we will essentially use a coordinator, which means it's really a centralized approach. In which, so what, what we'll assume is all processes are numbered, okay? And we'll assume that the processes in the system will first choose a coordinator for the lock, okay? And we know how to do that. We'll just run a leader election, and then we'll pick a coordinator. So some process is now the coordinator, okay? Now, the goal here is every process has to now check with the coordinator before it can enter the critical section. The coordinator is holding the lock, so you are basically going to send your lock request to the coordinator. And when the coordinator says the lock is granted, then you know you have the lock and you can get into the critical section. And then to release the lock, you will send another release message to the coordinator. Coordinator will set the lock to be free. Okay? So essentially now you are sending lock requests, getting back replies, sending lock release requests, getting back replies and so on. Okay? And there's a coordinator process that's going to handle this for every lock in the system. Okay. So to, ex to get the lock, you basically send a lock request, wait for a reply. The lock is in use, you will block. Okay. This because if there won't be a reply. This is the same thing where you try to do a lock acquire. The lock is already in use, you are blocked until whoever is holding the lock will release the lock. Same will be true here. You'll get a you'll send a request and you will not get a response. So you'll just be blocked waiting for that request. Okay. So, so here's a very simple example. There are four processes, 0, 1, 2, and 3. Okay. We have chosen three as our coordinator. Okay. So, and then the three is going to essentially keep the state of the lock, which is basically a binary variable that says is the lock free or in use. And it will keep a queue of all the processes that are waiting for the lock. Okay. So initially one sent a request for the lock. Okay. Lock is free. So one basically got the lock. So you sent an okay 
to one side, you have the lock. So one is now holding the lock, it's in some critical section, and then two has now sent a request for the lock. Okay? Since the lock is in use, two cannot get the lock anymore, so you'll just put two in the queue. So you will not send a reply. Okay? That's why two is going to be blocked, because this is a blocking call, and you'll just wait. Okay? Eventually, one is going to release the lock. Okay? At that point, three is going to check the queue to see if there is any process with the lock. There is one, and it will grant the lock to two. Okay, then two can enter, enter the critical section and so on. Okay, so that's a very simple approach. Okay, but you can imagine that there will be lots of problems when things crash and fail. Okay, so you could say one got the lock and then one crashed. Okay, two is waiting for the lock, but the lock is never going to be released because the process that holds the lock is gone. Okay, so you can't actually do anything. Or worse, coordinator crashes. Okay, so now essentially it's granted the lock and it crashed. So the other processes may not know what to do in this case because they can't even make lock. Okay, so, so failures of processes can cause all sorts of problems. Okay, that's why this is a complicated issue. We'll talk a little bit about this. Any questions on the basic approach, how this works? Yes, your question. Okay, that's a good question. Question is, when two has made a request and has not gotten a response from the coordinator, how do you know if the request was lost or the coordinator lock is in use? That is why you are not gotten it. Okay? So for the purposes of this example, assume that messages are going over TCP. Okay? And TCP will not worry about, so once you use TCP, you don't need to worry about lost messages because TCP will take care of transmi retransmissions for you. Okay? So you can essentially think of the TCP act as well, at least I got an acknowledgement saying my message was received. So I know that. So lack of a reply from three in this case means that the lock is in use, not that my message was. Okay? If you did not use TCP, that would be a valid question. Then you have to modify the protocol to send an acknowledgement saying I got your message. That's not an okay message saying you can have the lock. But you have to add an act saying, I at least received the message and you will hear back at a later. Okay? So that would have to be modified. But here we are just assuming a reliable network, which means that TCP is going to take care of this for us. We won't worry about it. Is this clear? Any other questions? All right. So what are some pros and cons here? So one advantage of the approach is because you're keeping a first come, first serve queue. It's a fair process to allocate locks. Locks are simply granted in the order in which they are received. That is in first come, first serve, or FIFO order. So you're not giving lock preferentially to any one process. Okay? It's a simple technique in terms of its complexity. There are only three messages we are using here. A request message to get the lock, a grant message that gives you the lock, and a release message to release the lock. Okay? So those are some good, good things about the approach. The shortcomings, there are many. Single point of failure, the centralized approach. Okay? Coordinator crashes, the whole thing is going to go down. You can't distinguish between a lock and use from a, a failed coordinator. Okay? If a client process that holds the lock crashes, then the lock, you are going to have a deadlock situation because no one can make progress because the lock is never going to be released. Okay? So you can have deadlocks, you might have a failed coordinator, all kinds of problems. Okay? So there are things you can have to do to figure out how to do this. I'm not going to go into approaches to solve the problem, but I can give you a couple of ideas to think about. So if the coordinator crashes, you can basically have a leader election that can essentially elect a new coordinator and that can take over the, the, uh, the lock management. Okay? However, the new leader has to actually recover the current state of the lock. It doesn't know when, what is the current state. Is the lock in use? Are there queues? The, is there, was there a queue? Of processes waiting for the lock and so on. Okay? So the state of the lock okay, that the coordinator maintains, which is the state of this queue, as well as the variable that says if the lock is used or not, has to be also kept somewhere on disk. Okay? In a file. So that if the coordinator crashes, the new coordinator can go and read the file to see what was the state of the lock. Otherwise, the new coordinator doesn't know how to start okay, because it doesn't know what was 
happening before the coordinator went down. So you have to add all of these things to that by itself doesn't solve all the problems, but those are some ideas that you can think of to how to deal with failures in the system. Client failure is a much bigger problem. A coordinator is up, client that holds the log goes down. Okay? Now you cannot actually figure out what to do because you're deadlocked. Okay? That problem is not solved yet. So that's much harder to deal with. Okay? The only way you deal with that problem is you have to fundamentally change the semantics of the log. Okay? You can't say current semantics as once a lock is acquired, whoever holds the lock can hold it indefinitely for any arbitrary amount of time before they release the lock. We do not put any limits on how long you can hold the lock. Okay? Only way to deal with client pro failed client processes is that you have to actually put a timer on the lock. Okay? And you can have a lock for the next T time units. Okay? And if the client is not done by that time, it has to actually renew the, the lock with the coordinator. So the coordinator knows that the lock is still required. Okay? Then in this case, if the client fails and the time the lock expires, the, client, the lock actually comes back to the coordinator. But that fundamentally changes the semantics of what locks mean because you want to make sure that you have, can hold the lock for an entire critical section, even if it's a long critical section. Okay? So you have to change things to make things work in presence of failure. Okay? That's the short answer. But anyway, we won't go too much into these details but something to keep in mind. Okay. Yes, question. Question is, that's a good question. What happens if the coordinator crashes uh, while it is writing to this? So, so that's a really good question. So, so you want to make sure that you actually first write to disk and then uh, send the lock grant request to the process. Okay? But you could ask that same question. What happens if I wrote to disk, but the coordinator crashed before as the grant request went out, right? So you can deal with all this when we get to distribute a transaction. So this is basically a very similar problem in databases. You are trying to make a transaction. You want to make sure no matter where you fail, things work. So when we get to distribute a transaction next time, we will try to solve some of this problem. So essentially, you need atomicity for writing to the file and granting the lock. And we don't know how to do atomicity yet. Those two operations have to be done together or none at all. Right? So that's called atomic operation. We'll talk about that next time when we do transactions. Okay? But it's a good question. All right, decentralized algorithm. So we'll say we don't like centralized. Let's use decentralized technique. So here we are going to use the concept of voting. Okay? We'll assume that there are n replicas and there's a coordinator for each replica. Okay, so think of each replica or each new process as a thread that is simply doing lock management. Okay, so to acquire the lock, you need a majority vote, okay, which means that you need a strict majority of the coordinator to say okay or not. Okay, so essentially non-blocking, non so the coordinators, the majority of them say, yes, you have the, the lock, then you can go ahead. So what's happening now is the lock state is replicated on multiple nodes. Okay. So now multiple, there are multiple coordinators that are all replicators, they all have the same state. So you basically have to get a okay from a majority. You don't need to wait for everyone to reply because they all have the same state. Internally, they have to keep the state consistent. We didn't say how to do that, but so long as the state is consistent, so long as the majority of the nodes say yes, you can have the lock, you can say it is safe for me to get. So that's the general process. Okay. You can have, again, coordinator crashes. Okay. We won't actually talk about that here. Okay. There are some analysis that you have to go through to know what's the probability things can go wrong and so on. But let's just skip that for a second. Okay. But just assume that you take this centralized approach okay. and the way you decentralize it is you made multiple coordinates. Okay. Each coordinator keeps the exact same state of the lock. And so now you have to send your lock request to multiple coordinators and wait for a strict majority to grant you the lock and then you are good. Okay? So even if some coordinators fail, so long as the majority of the coordinators are up, the lock can continue to function. That's the basic idea. You never want a minority to make the decision for you, but you still want a strict majority. Okay? So that's a decentralized, that's one decentralized technique. I'll talk about another one, okay, which is actually more a little more interesting. This one is called Rikat and Agarwala's 
locking algorithm. Okay. This is going to use the notion of logical clocks and timestamps okay, to do this. So essentially, we are going to use event ordering. Okay. We talked about logical clocks. We saw how that gives us event ordering. We are going to use event ordering and total order. Okay. And here's how you are going to do it. If a process, uh, n processes again. Okay. Process k wants to enter the critical section. Okay. It keeps a logical clock, okay, like any other clock. That's an integer. Okay. It's going to increment the clock. So that's your time step. You increment the clock by one. And it's going to send a request lock message saying, I'm process k. My uh, logical clock value is whatever it sent here, okay, the timestamp value. Okay. And it has to wait from, for a reply message from all other processes. Every other process in the system has to tell it, go ahead. Okay, before you can go out. So essentially, you are asking for the lock. You send your timestamp, ask for the lock. Then you wait for a reply from everyone before you can go ahead. Okay? And then how do you, how does a process uh, send back reply? So what's going to happen is if you re receive a request message from some other process, okay, if you don't need the lock, there's no contention locally, okay, you will send a reply. Okay? You send reply saying, I don't need the lock, go ahead. Reply just means go ahead. Okay? If you are already in the critical section, that means you hold the lock in across all the machines in the system, you will queue the request. Because you cannot reply yet, go ahead, because you hold the lock. Okay? Okay? And the third case is, you are actually also contending for the lock. Because you also want the lock and this other process. Maybe you have yourself sent request messages. So in this case, you are going to compare logical timestamps. Okay? And you will say, who sent the request first? based on the logical timestamp, and whoever sent the request first based on logical timestamp wins. So if the other process has a lower timestamp, that means it sent the request before you did in logical timestamp order, not in real clock time order. And you have to yield the lock. You have to send a reply saying, OK, you get the lock first, and I'll get it late. On the other hand, if your timestamp is lower, you win. Okay? You win across this pairs. Maybe there are others contending. You may not win globally, but you will at least Win against this process. In this case, you are going to queue and say, "Let's wait uh, and uh, before you get to enter the critical." System. So the logical timestamps here is essentially giving us an ordering of all the processes that are contending, and the timestamp is what tells us in what order they should enter the critical section. If there is contention, if you are the only process trying to enter, everybody is going to send replies, and you are done. There's nothing to worry about. But if multiple processes are trying to enter the critical section at the same time, and the one with the lower timestamp wins. Okay, it gets to go first, and then the other process gets to go. Is this clear? It's called Ricard and Agarwala's algorithm. Okay, you can see the complexity is 2n minus 1 because you're sending requests, you're getting back requests from everyone. Okay? So essentially, that's how it's going to work. Okay? It's fully distributed. Right? So there's no coordinator of any sort. In some sense, every process has to be participating in the lock management in this case. Yes, question. Okay, good question. Question is, how, how do you deal with what happens uh, when the process crashes? How do you deal with it? Okay, so that's what we have on the next slide. So there are pros and cons. Properties, good properties is fully decentralized. No need for a coordinator, no centralization, etc. Downside is n points of failure. Okay? As was asked, if any process crashes in this system, okay, you are not getting a reply message from that process. Okay? And what did we say? You need a reply message from every other process before you can enter the critical section. So even if there is no lock contention at all, nobody wants the lock. One process simply crashed. Okay? You are asking all processes, should I get the lock? That process is not going to reply. Everyone else is going to say, go ahead. That one process is not going to reply to you. You cannot make progress. That's the definition of what the, the, uh, the lock uh, protocol does. Okay? So essentially, dealing with failures is a big problem in this approach. Okay? It is fully decentralized. Okay? But since all processes are involved in a decision, any one process crashes, you are stuck. So this is one of those cases where a decentralized or a distributed technique actually has worse failure property than the centralized technique. Okay? At least in the centralized process, if some arbitrary process crashed that had nothing to do with lock management, 
you could make progress because coordinator is up, you are up, you get the lock. Here, if some arbitrary process that is not involved in the lock crashes, you cannot make progress. Okay? So, counter example of distributed system may not always give you better failure properties than centralized approaches. By and large, they do, but in this protocol, you actually have worse properties. Okay? So, yeah, it doesn't work with failures, unfortunately. Which is something you do want, but it doesn't work. Is this clear? Yes, question. So, the, so this was actually designed without assuming. Pain. So it's a so it's a good approach in that you don't need a coordinator, you don't need any clock synchronization, because the other way to do clock uh, to do fair allocation is to timestamp requests and say. Who made the request first? That process gets to go. You don't need to do all that. You're riding on Lamport's clocks, event ordering to figure things out. So a lot of good things, but doesn't have failure resiliency problem. So many techniques don't do any failure recovery. So if you don't need that, you can use it. If you assume that it has to work in the presence of failures, you should not use this. Is this clear? Okay. All right. Yet another technique, okay? token ring algorithm. Okay? This is like another ring based approach. Okay? So, um, so let me give you a little bit of background of where this algorithm came. This is also a distributed locking technique. Okay? Uh, this, this technique actually came from networking. Okay? So, I think maybe 30, 40 years ago, when local area networks were first being designed, there were two competing technologies there's Ethernet and there's token ring. So when you bought a PC in those days, you had to actually decide based on which environment the PC was going to con connect to, whether you wanted to get an Ethernet card or a token ring card, because they were, they were not compatible. Right? So either companies had a token ring based local area network where you connect your network to, uh, your connected machine to the network or that Ethernet. As you can imagine, Ethernet 1, that's what you have now, token ring just faded away, but it was a good technique in its day. Okay? And the to what did the token ring do? Okay. So essentially, it assumed that all the nodes in the network were numbered 0 through n. Okay. So here's our network. Okay. It's just a flat network. Those are all the, the circles are actual machines that are connected to a network. Think of a network as just a long wire. They're just connected to each other on a long wire. Okay. So you can send message to anyone. Okay. Now, the goal of a local area network is to ensure that only one process can transmit a packet at any given time. Okay? Because if two processes try to transmit to two different packets at the same time, you are going to have what is called a collision. Because essentially you try to put two packets, they go over the network, they collide, and then the packet gets garbage. Okay? Same thing is true of wireless channels, by the way. In today's Wi-Fi world, okay, so you have one access point, you cannot actually have two machines send packets at the same time to that access point on the same frequency because the fuel essentially collapse. Only one machine can transmit at any given time. Okay? So you have to think about this as a, as a big locking problem because you have to essentially have a lock on the network and then you can transmit that guarantees that nobody else does. Okay? So the token ring algorithm had a built-in locking protocol. Okay? So what they did is they created a special packet called a token packet. Okay? And this token circulated through the network. And so it's basically, uh, this is where the ring comes in. So this just looks like a set of machines with numbers on them. But if you assume that zero can only talk to one and one can talk to two and two can talk to three, you will see that the way the communication occurs in the network is a ring fashion. Because regardless, although two, zero can actually talk to any node, they restrict zero from only talking to its right neighbor. Okay. So essentially, if you want to communicate to some machine, Okay, so if zero wants to send a message to four, you can't directly send it to four. You have to send it to one, one sends it to two, and so on, and it gets to four. Okay, so essentially, you constructed a logical ring out of this network. Okay, so in this network, you have a special packet called a token packet, and the token is going to keep circulating. And the rule of the network is you cannot transmit any packet until you hold the token. The token is essentially your lock. Okay, so you don't ask for a lock. You just wait. Okay? Token keeps circulating and eventually gets to you. Once it gets to you, you hold the lock. So whatever messages you wanted to send, you send out. 
Once you are done, then you send the token to the next machine. Okay? That's the general rule. Okay? So this token keeps circulating and essentially whenever you have the token, you just get to transfer. Until you do, if you don't have the token, you don't transfer. Okay? Now in the networking world, because you want, you don't want to have arbitrary delays for sending your packets, you can hold the token for a max amount of time. Let's say you say 10 milliseconds. Okay? So essentially the locking time is at most 10 milliseconds. Once you get the token, your 10 milliseconds to send whatever you want and then at the end of the 10 millisecond, you have to forward the token even if you have more data and you wait for it. It's like time slicing, exactly like time slicing. You get a time slice when you hold the token. When the time slice expires, you have to send the token to the next machine. Is this clear? What I'm saying, okay. So that was essentially a token ring protocol. Okay, you can use the same idea now for locks. Okay, so essentially now your token is the lock. Okay? So the if you have to grab the lock, you don't actually ask for the lock. You just wait for the token to come to you. We will just relax the assumption that you have to hold the token for a fixed amount of time because in when you are writing a program, you cannot assume that your critical section will always be less than 10 minutes. Maybe it's going to take longer. So we'll not put that restriction. Okay. So once you have the token, you can wait for as long as you want to finish your critical section. Then you pass the token to the next element. And then if they don't need the lock, they'll just pass it on. But if they need the lock, they'll hold it, they'll do their critical section and they'll send it on. Okay. Very simple idea. Is this clear? Okay. Yes. It is very much like a round robin split. Okay, that's a good question. What is the need for a token? Okay, so the reason you need a token is that you don't know that every process actually needs to enter the critical set. If it was true round robin, you just give 10 milliseconds to every node. Okay, and then so in this case, every 80 milliseconds or so, you will get to enter the critical set. But that wastes time if some node does not want to enter the critical section, right? Yeah. So the message that skips is the token. That is the message. <laughs> so the token is essentially that. So if you want to skip, you just say, here, I pass the token. So that's exactly what it is, right? So that's what they did. Okay. Now the problem here is what happens if the token is lost? Right? Because network can go down, there can be Either the network can lose the token or the machine that holds the token can crash. Then what do we do? Okay, once the token is gone, it's not going to start circulating again. You'll be waiting forever. Okay, so, so this is basically where the problem arises. Right? So tokens can get lost because this is not, you are not assuming the network is perfect. Okay, there could be errors in transmission or the machine that holds the token can crash. In the networking world, this was easy. Okay. Because you bounded, you had a bound on the time each message, each node could hold the token. You said you can hold it for at most 10 milliseconds. You are guaranteed that if that time was T and there are N nodes in the system, you should see the token at most every N times T time units. Okay? If the token doesn't appear after N time T, you know it's lost. So there's the only way it won't appear. Because you have bounded the time you hold the token. Okay? So in the networking world, that was not a problem because you just have a timer. If the timer goes off, then you basically say that somebody has to regenerate the token and start passing it on again because it's lost. Okay, So you can just elect a coordinator and say, you keep a clock. If every n times t time is a token doesn't appear, you generate a new token and you restart the processing algorithm and everything is good. Okay? So, and you can only have one node regenerate the token. Because you can imagine if every node just says, I haven't seen the token ever. Since I sent it last and regen, it will be two tokens or more than one token, then you have a problem. Okay, but we know how to do leader elections. We have a leader that's doing token regeneration. Okay, so that part is solved. Okay? But in our case, where we are actually using it as a real lock, we cannot do this. Because we have assumed you can hold the lock for an arbitrary amount of time. So you don't know if the token is lost or if there is some node that's really having a long critical section and is taking its own time. So you cannot regenerate the token by putting any amount of timer because we didn't bound the criticals. Okay? So we took up the networking idea works well 
except in token regeneration because you don't know how to regenerate it well. Right? You could still put some bound, but that bound could always be exceeded by the excessively large critical sequence. So there is never a guarantee. The networking world, there was a guarantee. And you needed that guarantee because you can only have one machine transmit at the same time. If more than one machine transmit, you have what's called a packet collision and the packets don't reach their destination. Next question. Yeah. So you could have, as was as is being mentioned, you can have other approaches where the, the node that's holding the token for an excessively long time can send additional messages saying, I am alive, I am holding the token, so you know you don't need to region. So you can do all kinds of things, but you have to add more of that in for this to work. If you just wait for the token, it doesn't show up, you don't know what's happening. Okay? But in networking case, you knew what was happening because you knew the token was lost after the threshold amount passed. Is this clear? Okay? Very simple idea, but failures, you got to be careful how to deal with. All right, so let's do a very quick comparison and then uh, we'll see what other things we can, want to discuss. Okay, so we have looked at centralized, decentralized, distributed, token ring. Okay, first, let's look at all the problems. None of this actually really give us a good solution. So distributed locking is inherently a hard problem, okay? not very easy to deal with. Okay? Centralized approach, coordinator can crash. Okay? Decentralized approach suffers from starvation. Somebody is holding the token for a very long time. Distributed approach, crash of any process takes the whole system down. Okay? Token ring, you can have a lost token or crash processes. So, so this will tell you that is not an easy thing to solve regardless of how you deal with it. Okay? And then they have different amounts of complexity and different amount of time delay it might take for you to essentially figure out how much uh, time it's going to take to get, a, get the, the lock and so on. I'm just going to talk about this one just so that you know. Centralized case, there were three messages. Okay, you basically ask for a lock, you get a lock, you release the lock. Decentralized was 3MK because you have multiple requests being sent, responses being sent back and so on. Distributed 2N minus 1, you send requests, you send get back all replies, you are done. Okay? Token ring depends on the length of the ring. Okay? So you can have a very large ring that can have very large complexity. If it's small, then it's less. Okay? So different trade-offs. Different amounts of, uh, or not different amount, but different types of problems you have to deal with. Okay. Any questions on this? All right. So, one thing I'm going to do, uh, and then we'll end it a bit early today, is to talk about an actual large locks service, just to give you some sense of how these things are dealt with in very large scale distributed system. Okay. This is called the Chubby Lock Service. This was a locking protocol that Google developed for some of their distributed systems. Okay, so you will see how it essentially is. So this is designed not for fine grain locking, but very coarse grain locking. And it's going to use file systems to implement locks. Okay? So you have this concept of a Chubby cell, okay, which is essentially a set of five machines that are coordinators for locking. And these machines support up to around 10,000 servers that might need all kinds of lock. So this is essentially the locking service. So if you need a lock, you go to Chubby, you ask for the lock, and you, when you get the lock, you can do whatever it all you want, and then you can release the lock. So it looks a little bit like the centralized approach, except that you will see that there are five coordinators per, uh, per 1,000, 10,000 servers. And so, okay? One of the five machines is actually kept outside the data center. It's kept in a different location so that if the, even the entire data center goes down, okay, the state of the lock is kept somewhere else. That was the file I was talking about. right? So you have all the five machines keep the state of every lock to keep it consistent, but one of the machines is just outside for handling large scale disasters. You will still have consistent state of the lock. Right? And we are going to essentially use file system like the files are the mechanism you are going to keep the state of the lock. Okay? So what are some use cases? You can essentially use it to do leader election. Okay? This is essentially the opposite. You are using locks to do leader election. Okay? How do you do this? You have a lock. Okay? N processes contend for the lock. 
whoever gets the lock is the lead. Right? So you can essentially use locks to do leader election. You can just contend and somebody wins, only one node is going to win. Because the lock guarantees that only one node has the lock. Okay? And then you can advertise yourself as well. Okay? You can also use it for many other cases where you can hold locks for hours and days if you're doing some large scale computations and so on. Okay? So here is essentially a picture that shows you how all of this works. So first thing is within a chubby cell, you are going to elect a primary node. Okay? And then those are going to have, have replicas. Each of them are going to maintain a database that keeps the state of the lock. And chubby manages lots of locks. It should be clear, you're not managing one lock. You are not going to have five machine do. So you may be managing thousands of locks for all kinds of processes. So this is your centralized locking service. Every time you want to create a lock, you go to Chubby, create a new lock, and then use it, and so on. Okay? So you, you are going to use files as the way to do locks. And basically, most file systems internally support locking. Okay? So if you use your local file system, it actually supports read-write locks. Okay? So you can open a file in read mode, read lock mode, or write lock mode. So that ensures that a thread can only have uh, one, only one writer can go at one time and so on. Okay? So we'll just use the file system abstraction to keep a state of the lock. For every lock you want to maintain in the system, we'll create a file. Okay? You want to create a lock named foo, we'll create a file named foo. Okay? And then if requests come to ask, uh, there are requests to ask for that lock, we'll essentially start a thread and we'll say, go grab a lock on that file. If the thread gets a lock on the file, we'll grant that lock back to whoever asked. If the lock is in use, that thread will block. Okay? And then whoever asks for the lock has to block. So we are essentially using basic file system locking okay, to keep state of the lock. And you are using file system locking as opposed to keeping a variable named foo in memory. You could have implemented in memory lock. And you could have made a variable and said, every time somebody wants a lock, you try to ask for a lock on that variable and only grant it. But remember that this has to be persistent. Okay? So if you keep things in memory and the machine fails, then all the state is gone, which is why you keep things on disk. Okay, so that keeps things persistent. So, so here the primary can fail. You can create new replicas and whatnot. Since everything is stored on a distributed file system, okay, all the state is still there even if machines fail. Okay? So, and you will see that the client, if, to get a lock, essentially it uses an RPC. So it's going to send an RPC to a chubby cell asking for a lock. So all the lock requests, lock release they go as rpc messages so these are your coordinator nodes okay so this is basically a very simple not very simple a very complex version of our centralized locking protocol except that there are five coordinators they are all keeping state consistent they are using disk state to reflect the lock state and so on and so on. okay so essentially this is how google implemented its uh, locking protocol okay i'm going to